Cracknell, OBE is one of Britain's most successful athletes with two Olympic gold medals and six world championship titles to his name. Since retiring from professional rowing, James has become the founder and director of Threshold Sports and uses his expertise to captivate audiences. So I'm delighted to introduce you to British sporting hero, James Cracknell. Thanks, Helen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, originally, I, I thought I'd speak about resilience, as I believe it's the determining trait in success. You know, perhaps I place resilience on on a pedestal because I wasn't exactly blessed with uh, a huge amount of natural talent. And when I was racing, I, I'm convinced that there were any number of more naturally talented blokes than me in a bar saying I could have been. But I bet the biggest reason why they're in that bar, not on the field of play, was because the first time they got knocked down, they didn't want to get back up. Now, I'm not saying resilience is a synonym for tough. Okay, it's one of the alternatives if you're looking at Theosaurus, but so are irrepressible, robust, flexible, durable, buoyant, feisty, and spirited. All characteristics I'd want and expect and demand in a teammate, and then neatly encapsulated in that one word, resilience. Now, without it, nobody could execute the physically and mentally unrelenting, sort of motivational, sapping four-year training program and, and crew selection process required to win the Olympics. Every setback would be seen as a disaster, every success over-celebrated, Pressure would, would limit, not inspire, and teammates actually wouldn't challenge or support each other in equal measure. And without any of those things, you've got no chance. You already can probably tell it's quite hard to steer myself away from talking about resilience. But instead, I've opted to talk about a period of my life where I was really struggling. I tried using the mental skills that had served me well in sport, but ultimately I had to face the fact they weren't working, open my mind and learn new skills and strategies. At this point, it had been more than six years since I raced my last Olympics, which was Athens in 2004, and my career and perspective on life were, were starting to change. Through a combination of, of luck, backing myself and making the most of some post-Olympic opportunities, I'd rode across the Atlantic, been to the South Pole, and I was somehow forging a career doing the things that I enjoyed. Um, but also now, despite not having been in a boat for Olympiad, I had actually started to, to retire properly, consciously. Up until then, I'd still been appraising myself as though I was ranked on a list. If I was at the top, I was good. If I wasn't on the top, something was bad. Now, I was becoming more reflective. Was I a good dad? Was I a good husband, colleague, mate? Was I happy? All the really important metrics rather than, than where you're ranked. At this time, Discovery Channel had just documented my participation in a running race called the Marathon de Sable in the Sahara. Actually, I think it was more of an entry point into the landscape than any interest in my running ability. Um, but they were pleased with how the programme went. And then they actually said, we want you to do a, what they called an active travelogue, which was travelling from Santa Monica Pier in the west of America through the States to any of the Statue of Liberty, so via cycling, running and rowing in a boat, obviously. Um, so we set off from LA and after two days, I entered Death Valley, so 300 miles cycling. I happily chucked the bike in the back of the RV at the appropriately named Furnace Creek. And it was time to go to go running. And after sort of trudging 80 miles, surrounded by salt plains, sand, desert, and 45 degree heat, I resembled and felt pretty much like a, a piece of tempura. But the, the capacity of the human body, as you'll, you'll hear from everyone else, and its ability to endure constantly amazes and surprises me. And the last thing I felt like doing after running 80 miles was, um, was getting back on the bike. And uh, there we are. that's the, uh, so getting back on the, uh, getting back on the bike. But it's amazing how the body responds quickly. The, the fresh breeze, the relatively easy speed were helping me almost recover from the run. Um, the next day actually is, is what Bev calls, my wife calls my, my second birthday, and it changed the lives of people around me forever and myself. I remember waking up and it was a brilliantly um, sunny morning, the stars and stripes banner outside the, uh, banner, flag, sorry, outside the motel was hanging limply, so it was sunny, warm, no wind. I thought, brilliant, let me at it. Uh, my next memory was three weeks later in a very white room. So 15 miles down the road, um, I got out of the motel, turned right, so west, so east, um, and a, a fuel truck had hit me 
traveling at 60 miles an hour and it wing mirror had hit my helmet. I was airlifted to a hospital in Phoenix and I was in a coma for two weeks. And having me called to my bedside from the UK as soon as I was admitted in preparation for the worst, Ben, fa ben found out when I was like this that I was in, uh, she was pregnant with our, with our third child. I spent five weeks in that hospital and three weeks in a, in a London hospital before being discharged. Uh, when I was released, among other things, the neuropsychologist sat us down and, and, and said that 82% of people with a brain injury get divorced. So I hadn't left hospital, but already I was, I was a statistic. Will I be one part of the 82% or part of the 18%? The rehabilitation from the physical trauma was actually the easy part of the recovery. It was rebuilding people's confidence in my capability. My confidence in my capabilities was, was that much harder. And Bev recounts a story a week after I'd regained consciousness. And the, I can't remember it, but the nurse had given me lunch, a starter, a main course, and a dessert. And apparently without saying anything, I tipped the starter and, and the dessert onto the main course um, and thought nothing of it. And Bev asked the nurse, what the hell's he done? And the nurse's reply was, they all do that, meaning people with, with a brain injury. And, and for Bev, that's when I went from being part of the normal population into a, into a different group. And I don't think I ever came back in her eyes. There are also behavioral changes. Uh, initially, I had a real lack of social inhibition and spoke before thinking. But crucially, I suffered a lack of motivation. I lost the ability to plan, organize, and had no self-confidence. Those were all traits that I'd previously been able to rely on. And those changes took time for those close to me to adjust to family, but also getting accepted back in the workplace took far longer. I was initially skeptical, perhaps that comes from a sporting background of behavioral therapy, but I realized and, and completely engaged in it. And being single-minded and determined, which I think had initially helped in the early stages of my recovery, were now limiting my cognitive recovery. And it was made worse by seeing and hearing people's distrust in, in my decision-making that previously had never been questioned. And little decisions on a daily basis were still were being questioned. I was improving, but my relationship with, with Bev and the, and the kids, now three of them, was, was definitely affected. And my lad was only six when I had the accident, um, old enough to be aware that his mum was upset, something bad was happening. He and his younger sister who come to America saw me in a bad way in hospital. And when I did wake up, I must have been unrecognisable to them. Uh, I spoke slowly, apparently I couldn't concentrate for very long. And when I came home, aspects of his behavior that had never previously bothered me suddenly did. I was inconsistent and distant when all kids want is consistency to be hugged and heard. And it really breaks my heart to think what he went through. Less than a year together, we were at home on a Saturday night, just me and him. I had a seizure and collapsed. And at that point, I hadn't been diagnosed as epileptic. I regained consciousness in the ambulance that he'd called. And he's grown up seeing his father be vulnerable, struggle, and nearly taken from him. And my old man's 75, and in my eyes, is still unbreakable. So for, for my son to witness that twice by the age of seven has a profound effect on him and me. Bev had commented that you know, I'd been quiet and down for significant periods, but crucially never cried in front of the kids. After the accident, I was determined not to feel sorry for myself, thinking, you know, how is that going to help me recover? And I realized too late that showing emotion and asking for help is actually a sign of strength, not of weakness. And without question, if I'd done that, it would have helped my lad, the family and my marriage, if I'd let them know what I was really feeling. And my son would have been able to say how scared he felt, lonely, sad and angry for a long time. And that again, that's something I'm ashamed of. We've had those conversations now, but for years afterwards, we didn't. I'm not having a girl neurologist, but they're not the most positive bunch. And they've repeatedly told me that my cognitive behavior would improve, but then plateau after three to four years. By then I'd recovered enough to know that if you allow someone to determine their potential, they'll reach far higher than if you say something, you're then limiting it. And at this point, for most of, of my marriage to Bev, I had a goal on the horizon, but at this point I was really drifting. And so I think Bev's, Support had turned to frustration and criticism, which further, yes, it's understandable, but also undermined my self-confidence. So I become withdrawn and really carried a, a heavy cloud whenever I saw the kids. 
and they could pick up on the atmosphere between between Bev and I, and I didn't want that to feel normal in any way for them. I had to change. The Olympics was something I did not who I am. The accident happened to me, but I refused to be defined by it. And sadly, and it's one of the there were good things and bad things about being in the public eye a bit, but people ask, are you okay after the accident? I'd had enough of answering that question. And also Bev saw our life in two parts. There was the pre-accident and post-accident James. Everything I did was seen through the prism of brain injury. So I need to change her perception of me, other people's perception of me, and crucially, I think, my perception of myself. And how was I going to do that? Uh, I was actually going to start taking control of my shit rather than just mindlessly drifting. So I applied to do an, an MPhil on human evolution and behavioural science at Cambridge University. It would complement the work I've been doing on public health and show that my mental capacity could no longer be questioned. I would also trial for the boat race. So if I could win a seat in the boat race over 15 years after I last raced, it would show everyone also that physically and mentally that prism which I was now viewed through was totally irrelevant. Um, I was successful at gaining a place uh, at Cambridge. Um, it was a family decision. You've seen that picture before. And I took the kids up there. That's my college at Pete's house. I took my kids up there, made them an absolute part of it. But after a month, I realised I'd left it too late for our marriage before I went. I missed the kids enormously. Academically, I'd bitten off more than I could chew. And rowing had moved on. I was playing catch up. I called home and, and told Bev, I'm going to drop out. And, and she said to me, people will think I've made you. So right then, I knew I had to sort it out on my own. And I did what I should have done months or even years before, call mates and tell them I was struggling. And as mates are, they were there for me. One recommended psychiatrist, I went and saw him and he gave me some simple advice. He prescribed me twice a week, I want you to go out and meet new people, ask them questions. When have you last done that? People will see you as you, and didn't know you before. And also you need to rebuild the free legs in your store, your relationship with your kids, the academics that you're going through and also the sporting side you know the kids i had a to rebuild that relationship with them and part of that was i was in a different place um in cambridge and then i wanted to make it like home for them i also academically had to get my head around studying when there was no internet beforehand so throw myself into to both and i think with the kids especially i'd being guilty, I think, as, as many of us are, of physically being in the room, but mentally being outside the room. And ever since Bev and I decided to separate, my, my belief is I'm going to be there physically and mentally for them every time I'm in a room. Sporting, I wasn't the, I had the track record, but I wasn't that guy anymore. I was at the bottom and was now, to be honest, in a position that I liked of, of trying to prove people wrong. I had to changed the way I trained, I had to change the way I socialised. I was older than all but two of the guys' dads who I was in a boat with. So my cultural references were slightly different. I made the crew with a month ago with the eight month selection process. I wasn't the first name on the sheet by a long, long way, but I also made my presence known. I challenged them constantly to the challenges, to, to set the standard that we needed. And as with the Olympics, I wasn't going to not say anything and then regret having not said it after the race. In terms of the race itself, it was a brutal day, a day I'll never forget with a group of like guys I'll have a relationship with forever. Um, I'm not sure that I'll make the uh, I'll make the 25th reunion as uh, I'll be significantly older than them. Um, it was an incredibly special day. Um, if I, I submitted my thesis nine years to the day after I got knocked off my bike by that truck. And I remember, I think when I handed it in, I thought if I told the neurologist I'd be doing this nine years after, he'd have shaken his head. But it hurts that I'm divorced. I don't get to wake up with my kids in the house every day. But I now make sure the days that I spend with them are really filled and not wasted. They know I'm there for them unconditionally and we speak about absolutely everything. And crucially, they know that dad now doesn't come with a rain cloud. But it might not always be sunny, but the weather is definitely getting better for all of us. I think if the last decade has, has shown me anything, it's the, the real meaning of resilience. I genuinely believe if I went back into elite sport now, I'd be better equipped mentally 
to support myself and my teammates because of what, what I've been through. Thank you. Thank you.